Hi folks, this video is going to be about how to set piston valves with Walshart valve gear. And a few years ago, I posted a video on how to set Walshart's valve gear using this green Atlantic here in the back. And that engine has slide valves, as do many um, early style live steam locomotives. Um, but in the years that have ensued, I have been working on this uh, Denver and Rio Grande uh, narrow gauge 282. This is an engine that is, uh, its design has been published in Live Steam magazine for the past uh, 10 years or so. And this engine has piston valves, has Walsh Rats valve gear. And I've gotten comments on my previous video asking, you know, is, are there any differences with piston valves compared to slide valves when you're setting valves? So we'll use this opportunity to go through some of those differences and explain how we do it. So inside the steam chest is a piston valve and a liner that the valve rides in. And in the photo here, you'll see as I was building this engine, I took a photo of that liner and the valve. And if you see on the top of the photo, the middle of the photo um, is the liner and at the bottom is the piston valve itself. Now, the ports are located in the liner. And you can see on this liner, there's five ports. There is the steam delivery in the center. Then going outwards, you have uh, on each side one port going to each of the um, each end of the cylinder, and on the far ends you have the exhaust ports. Now this is what's known as an inside admission piston valve because the delivery steam comes from the center, the inside, goes through the pist cylinder and piston, and then, then exhausts on the outsides of the valve. Um, there are examples of what are called outside admission piston valves where that is the opposite, so the steam will be delivered from the outside and exhaust to the middle. And in fact, slide valves are by definition inside admission, and we'll get back to that later when we talk about the valve gear that drives it. Now at the bottom of the photo is the piston valve itself, and you can see um, it has two, it's a spool with two valve ends on it, and on each end of the valve are two piston rings, and those piston rings act as the valve face. So when we're setting the valve, we're going to be referencing those rings as the point at which uh, steam is divided between um, the admitting side of the valve and the exhaust side of the valve. So in this photo is the valve itself in the liner and underneath my finger is the admission point, the high pressure side where steam is admitted into the valve chest, into the liner, and then moving to the right is one of the ports to the cylinder and then all the way to the right is one of the exhaust uh, ports. So you can see here the rings are compressed into the liner and as those rings pass, the port edges are when your valve events take place. And in the last photo here, we are looking at the liner now installed, pressed into the cylinder block, into the steam chest, and the valve placed inside the liner. Now the other critical piece of timing piston valves are the use of these sight holes. And there are two sight holes on the steam chest, one and two, one for the front side of the cylinder, one for the rear. And these are purely here for uh, sighting the valve um, to view the valve events. And so now we're looking through the sight hole into the piston valve chamber and as the engine moves forward here is the front spool of the valve passing the port. And so what we're looking for is that rear ring, that's the one on the right, that's our admission side of the piston valve. As that passes the port edge on the right side, and here it goes again, this point right here should be at our dead center when steam is then admitted into the front side of the cylinder. And I mentioned earlier that this is an inside admission piston valve, meaning that steam is entering from the center and then being distributed to either side of the cylinder, then exhausting to the outside of the valve chest before going to the stack. And that's important because when we watch that piston valve pass on the front side, we're watching the rear ring pass this edge here. This hole is the same width as the port in the liner. And we're going to be watching that inside edge on this side and the inside edge on this one as well. Now you're wondering, do I have inside admission valves or outside admission valves on my engine? Well, the easy way to check is to look at the connection between uh, the radius rod, this rod here, and the combination lever, this rod here. Now on an inside admission locomotive, 
the connection point will be above the valve stem. So you see that there's two pins. There's one pin at the top and another pin actually hidden down in the crosshead for the valve guide. Now if you look at an outside admission locomotive, and we'll use the Atlantic here as an example, you see it's the opposite. So the connection to, from the radius rod to the combination lever is below the valve stem. So that's the easy way to tell. The other usual giveaway is the position of the eccentric crank. So usually on an outside admission valve gear, the eccentric crank point will be 90 degrees ahead of the uh, crank pin. And on an inside admission locomotive, usually this eccentric point will be 90 degrees behind. Now that's not always the case, but as a general rule that, that tends to be the case. And if you recall from the previous video, one of the critical elements of timing the valves is setting the dead centers of the engine. Now if you go back to that previous video, and I'll post a link in the description, uh, I described how to find the dead center on the engine, and we do that using a combination of um, finding the limit of travel on the crosshead, uh, scribing that on the crosshead, and then swinging an arc on the driving wheels and marking um, actually three points on the tire. And on this engine, because it's an outside frame, this is a little bit tricky, but if you come and look down here, um, you see I've marked those three spots on the tire, and I'm actually just using the brake shoe um, as a marker for those timing spots. The next piece is this eccentric rod, and that was another issue I discussed briefly but didn't really demonstrate, which is how do you set the length of this rod, because that's actually very critical. And on a new build engine, you're going to be setting that uh, as you set the valves, and so uh, I'm going to demonstrate that here in a moment as how I did that on this locomotive. So what I'm showing here now is this adjustable eccentric rod. And we use this when we're building the engine because we don't actually know yet the length of this rod. It could be dependent on where the final positioning of the driving axle is relative to the eccentric rod. Now, it's set right now in um, dead center and at the correct length. And as we talked about in the last video, at dead center, and at the correct crank position and the correct length, we're going to raise and lower the radius rod. As we do that, there should be no motion at the valve stem. And in the previous video, I demonstrated that if you have the wrong position of the crank, and we'll just move it that way a little bit, we'll come back here. And as I raise and lower the rod, we'll actually start to get some motion in the valve stem and we know that we need to adjust it to eliminate that motion. So, how do you do both the length and the crank position? And I'm going to demonstrate if we make this the wrong length. So now, for the purposes of this demonstration, I've made this eccentric rod a little bit too short. And so, using the correct crank position, but the two short connecting rod on dead center, we're going to come back and again we're going to find that the valve stem is giving motion as we raise and lower the radius rod. Now we're on dead center and as you're doing this for the first time you may not know that this is the wrong length and you adjust the crank so we see that as we raise the radius rod the valve moves forward which means that to correct we want the crank to cut the the link to come back a little bit. To make the link come back, we move the uh, eccentric crank forward, and we do that until we get it free running. So just a little more. And now this is free running, no motion at the valve stem. But what happens is we move the locomotive to back dead center. So we're on back dead center now, and we go to move the radius rod, and suddenly we're getting motion again at the valve stem. So we know the length is now incorrect because we cannot get the same motion or same lack of motion at the valve stem on the two dead centers. So now we know we need to adjust 
this rod. In this case, we know it's too short because when it is getting that motion, we see the valve move forward as the radius rod goes up. That means the, the link is too far this way, which means this actually wants to come back. We need to actually lengthen that a little bit with the crank. So um, that's how you would go about setting this length. You It's sort of an iterative process between moving the crank and setting your length here until at both dead centers you get uh, zero motion uh, from the valve stem when you swing the radius rod from forward to reverse. So now that we've set the eccentric crank and the eccentric rod, we're going to move up to setting the valve in the valve chest. Um, now just like in the previous video we looked at setting the slide valve, we were concerned about where the slide valve uh, position was front to back so that we got equal uh, lead on the admission port, meaning that at dead center the amount that the valve uh, was open on one side is the same as the amount of the valve was open on the other side at the opposite dead center. Um, this is a little tougher to do with piston valves and I'm not going to disassemble it uh, to, to show you completely how that's done. Um, but if you look at the valve stem here, the way we would adjust the valve on the stem is um, there's a lock nut here and you can actually thread the valve stem in and out of the uh, valve stem crosshead to change the position of the valve on the stem to make that adjustment. Uh, but what I'll show you right now is just how to uh, sight that valve. And remember, um, we'll be starting on front dead center. So on front dead center, we're going to be interested in the uh, front portion of the valve. And there's two rings. We're going to be looking at the uh, rear ring on, the, on this side of the valve, passing this port edge here. So as you roll the engine uh, forward, uh, past and up to dead center, um, we should see that valve ring uh, having just cleared this edge, meaning the entirety of that ring will now be forward of this edge of the port. And if we roll the engine back to uh, dead center on the rear, uh, we'll do the same thing. Uh, again, roll the engine forward. We're going to be looking to the inside ring against this edge of the port and we want that ring to fully clear in this direction uh, to open the port to the cylinder and you can see here through the borescope view as the uh, valve clears we can see that on both front and dead center um, that valve is just barely cracked open and that's just how we want it So that's really it. We've uh, set the valves on the locomotive. Um, I demonstrated how to do it in forwards. You should probably also double check it in reverse to make sure that your valve events are uh, equal for both forward and reverse. And just to double check, we've uh, hooked the engine up to some compressed air here and we'll uh, see how, how it goes. And the engine sounds nice and square, so we, uh, we did the job. So I hope you found that helpful, and um, any questions, any comments, love to hear them in the comment section below. And I hope to do some follow-up videos with some other uh, elements as we move forward with this locomotive. Um, one item that I'm going to look forward to doing next and sharing with you all is actually machining the piston rings, because on piston valves that, uh, that seal that the ring creates uh, between the exhaust side and the intake side is actually really critical to the engine performing well. Um, so I'll be following up with a a video on how to make those rings. And as we move forward with the engine, I'm hoping to uh, share some other aspects as well, maybe boiler making, um, some of the other uh, finer details as we move forward. So thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, please hit the follow button on my page. Thank you.